No, I, I'm actually, I've lied to you. Um, I'm not gonna talk about who gets to be gifted. Um, I'm actually here to talk about who doesn't get to be gifted, which is um, more important to me. It's more important to me because, as Brian said, um, my wife and I founded a charter school in Harlem. I've been an educator in Harlem for the last 13 years, and I've seen how uh, disproportionately children are labeled as gifted, or in Harlem and other places like Harlem around the city, they have other labels that are uh, not so savory and not so exciting. And I wanna talk to you about some simple things that schools should be doing differently that can help alleviate that problem. Now, uh, I also wanna arm you with some public policy um, armor that will allow you to interpret or ask the right questions when you hear the debates going back and forth um, around school reform, school policy. So um, some simple priorities inspired by one of my former students named Tom. Um, Tom, when he came to um, my classroom in third grade, this is over 10 years ago, he had already gotten a lot of labels. He was special education, he was an orphan. Um, he had suffered from various kinds of abuse and neglect. And I saw um, with Tom uh, that, first of all, there were, there were more moments when Tom was under my desk hiding or running around the classroom than there were times when he was sitting at his desk doing his work. Here's a picture of him pretending to work, making me feel good. So I could take a picture and he would actually uh, posing for, for the camera. However, uh, Tom picked up everything I said. When I assessed him, he knew what I was talking about. He could do the work. He was reading on grade level at that time. Um, that's gifted to me. Uh, Tom was a survivor. Um, he, didn't, he shouldn't have had to survive the way he did. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why he was in the situation he was in. Um, however, I started to see as the year went on and then in the 10 years since, how, again, these simple priorities I'm gonna get to could have changed his life path and developed the gifts that he has. Education policy, education reform, what's going on? How do I handle these, these things that are coming at me. Well, there are three areas that I think really get to this question about who gets to be gifted and who doesn't. From the school's perspective, uh, the first area is everything outside the school, what Dave Crenshaw was talking about, uh, family structure, community life. Schools can't control those things. So I'm not gonna talk about that right now. The second thing is uh, the most important part of it, which is the actual work, the execution of the teaching and the magic that happens in a well-run classroom when a child goes from one set of understandings to another. If I were a better teacher at that time, seeing Tom go from under my desk to actually doing his work and engaged and excited. Too complicated to talk about right now either. Uh, I wanna talk about something much more simple and basic, and that is the very learning conditions in the school themselves, which are entirely under the control of the adults in the building. And I wanna talk about Maslow's hierarchy. I do think that Maslow's hierarchy should inform school priorities. And all the talk that's up here about the best way to do this, the best way to do that, ignores the fact that in our schools, we're not addressing the issues that are at the very bottom of Maslow's pyramid. Maslow said in his research, studying gifted people, that if you don't have a strong foundation, forget about the roof. You could have solar panels and wonderful chimneys and all kinds of things, it'll collapse without a strong foundation and a good basement without cracks. So his first item was physiological needs, the need for nourishment, the need for protection from harm. I'm sorry, but in 2011, it's unconscionable for a mom to come to my school and say, um, I'm taking my child to your school because there were too many fights in his old school, in third grade. How many fights is too many fights? Is one fight too many? She didn't say there was a fight. She said there were too many fights. Fights are entirely preventable in schools. It takes a sense of leadership, a sense of community. It takes a lot of listening on the part of school administrators and faculty. It takes engagement, and it takes a school-wide, that means parents, teachers, administrators, and students, investment in the idea that we are going to be a safe place the first thing we need is protection from harm at our school. And if that's not happening, everything else isn't going to matter. I read about three fights in schools that made the papers this week. Think about that. 
The next thing is emotional safety. Now, he called it safety needs, but he talks all about this sense of emotional safety. With Tom, I really struggled to find that and create that. I let him do some things in my classroom that I knew were inappropriate because I knew that he, needed, he had a need for acceptance and he had a need for someone who would be there with him because he has gone from one home to another and so forth. There needs to be a team that supports kids who are most in need. Um, at the school where I taught with Tom, uh, I knew there was a, a counselor. I knew there was uh, a special education teacher. There wasn't time in our day to be able to meet. And the culture of the school system at the time was, well, 3 o'clock, everyone's gone. So I would stay after, sit alone in my classroom and think about Tom, um, but I couldn't talk to anyone about it. At our school, we've learned lessons from that. Um, I've talking to a first grade teacher this week about a child who's new to our school this year who's experiencing post-traumatic stress symptoms at the age of six, screaming in the classroom, afraid to go into the bathroom. We have his file and his history of, of what happened to him last year that has led to this. Um, she's not alone. There are 10 people who are in this conversation together. Um, instead of the one counselor Tom had for 1,700 kids in that school who later had a nervous breakdown from her own experience, we have two social workers for our 300 kids. Still feels like it's not enough, but they're probably the most underappreciated people in the building because uh, they are there understanding what kids' needs are, communicating with the teachers, encouraging the teachers, supporting them, Yesterday, the child that I was talking about had a great day. Went home, he has an incentive plan in place, and able to celebrate it with the assistant principals, with the social workers, all of us who are invested and involved in supporting the teachers, the four teachers on the grade team who work very closely together and all know each other's kids. There's a sense that we all have ownership over the success of all the kids in our building. If schools aren't doing that, everything else doesn't matter. The sense of love and belonging was the next thing that Maslow talked about, for me, that comes down to community in a school. Um, I'm not sure why it is, I'm sure why it is, but I'm not sure that uh, other folks appreciate this disparity. Alumni groups seem to be only for the wealthy. To me, every elementary school in the city should be following, tracking its alumni and keeping up with them. That social network that we have now available through technology it should be captured and it should be used to create a safety net for kids who are living in poverty and go on from one school to the next. When I started researching as we started to graduate our first alumni and talking to other public schools, what do you do for your alumni? Well, we, uh, you know, sometimes we see them, they come back, or sometimes they, you know, we talk to other schools. Mostly they just kind of flitter away, we're not really sure. Um, it took me 10 years to find Tom after he left our school. I was not legally allowed to know where he was. And I learned when I finally caught up with him, that um, he had spent 10 years, as I guessed, bouncing from one social agency to another and the last five years in the prison system. Esteem. So self-esteem gets a bad rep, overrated, touchy-feely. However, um, the new wave of charter schools or reform-minded schools will tell you that unless there's a, a real rock-solid belief in the fact that the kids can learn, you're not gonna get anywhere. So again, all the other education policy discussions, and notice I haven't talked about anything that's in the current landscape of education reform if you read the papers. It won't matter. There should not be a single adult in a public school that says about any child, this kid can't learn or this kid can't do that. When I started out teaching, I was told, uh, you should go teach in the suburbs. Kids can learn there. And I was told, uh, I just can't wait to cut my teeth, get my experience, and then I'm out of here because I can't get a job anywhere else until I have a couple of years experience. There are teachers, and I think this is less true now, 15 years later, but who see inner city schools as a breeding ground for their own experience, rather than as a place where children come for nourishment and learning. So now we get to self-actualization, and that's where the, the gifted label can finally be applied. Well, guess what? Um, it's not gonna happen without all those other things. So let me give you my um, three pieces of advice. First of all, this stuff is very simple, but it's not easy. I'm not saying that school people are bad, teachers are bad, administrators are bad. I'm saying that priorities are screwed up right now because we're not paying attention to Maslow's hierarchy in schools. We're not bringing in those issues in the, in the community and making sure that the school is a safe place before we worry about anything else. 
That's a simple idea, although it's very hard to pull off. Here's your armor. Be skeptical about ideas. There's a lot of quick fixes. No child left behind. The other teachers and I laughed 10 years ago when there's this goal was set up. How are we going to get there? It's a wonderful idea that every child should be proficient. And it raised the stakes, and it raised the notion of expectations. To think that it's going to fix everything is folly. Nothing will fix everything. Every community school is different. Ask about priorities. So is this the most important thing? If there are fights going on in a school, do you really worry about the pension right now? Let's fix the safety. Let's fix the sense of community belonging and teamwork at a school before we worry about other highfalutin ideas around pedagogy. And finally, um, ask about school level investment. All the things I'm talking about are very individual for school communities. It's really hard to make policy that's going to be effective in addressing Maslow's hierarchy across an entire city, across an entire state, an entire nation. It takes individual school community investment and leadership to make this stuff happen. So when you read something or hear something, some talking head going on about schools should do this, schools should do that, ask yourself which schools because some schools already are probably doing those things, and others can't get there yet because they need more time to deal with Maslow's hierarchy. Thank you for your time, and uh, come visit my school.